The Secrets of Star Wars is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. I am Emily Swallow, also known as the Armorer on The Mandalorian. And I'm just giving a little shout out to the Secrets of Star Wars podcast because this is the way. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, episode 185. Hello there. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sentence was wrong. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's against my programming to impersonate a dead. That's not how the Force works. Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. Remember, the Force will be with you, always. Hi, I'm Robert King, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, where we look at the deeper themes and meanings found in the stories and characters in that galaxy far, far away. This episode is another installment in our occasional series on the spirituality of the Force. This episode should be dropping just before Ash Wednesday, so it seems like a good thing to talk about the various disciplines related to the Force, especially what you give up to be a Jedi, or maybe to be a Sith. Joining me on the panel today are... Possible Jedi, possible Sith, Thomas Salerno. Good to have you. <laughs> hey there, Robert. And possible Sith, possible Jedi, Patrick Mason. Hey, Welcome, wait, Patrick. Wait, why did you start with Sith? Hey, Robert, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I was just flipping things around. It's called flipping the script. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> yeah, so... The Force is, well, you know, it's it's one of these things where it takes, they're always talking about, you know, it takes discipline in order to master the Force and to, to uh, discover how to use the Force and to, uh, you know, become one with the Force, you know, to discover the will of the Force, things like that. And as Catholics, we also put a lot of emphasis on discipline uh we have our moral teachings of course but also our uh penitential practices and our sacrificial practices and especially as we're coming up on lent um you know that idea of of giving up something for lent in remembrance of uh christ giving up his life for us um so there's you know there's definitely going to be some overlap here I'm not sure how much um, (laughs) because, you know, we're looking at, you know, are we looking at different kinds of discipline? Are we looking at different purposes for discipline? Um, And yet we use the same word and we, we have some similar practices. And I, and I think especially um, among the Jedi, I think George Lucas explicitly patterned the Jedi in part on the Western monastic tradition, uh, you know, also obviously on samurai and on Eastern monastic traditions, but, but in part, he had this, this notion of, of, you know, Catholic, uh, priests in, in particular, I think in mind. I mean, in an early script, they're called the Jedi Templars. So oh, I really, def- yes. Yeah. Yeah. I did so, not know that. Yeah. And, the. Uh, the Templars were a military order, but also a monastic order. You know, not in, only in did, actual history, in actual yes. history. Yes. You know, the According Templars not only. Yeah. If you, if you trust that guy. <laughs> um, does anybody <laughs> trust that guy? I mean, he's, he's not even a guy. He's a Time Lord, right? So I, I don't know. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. A Time Lord or perhaps a cryptid. We don't know. <laughs> Ooh, I Perhaps had, a time I about is a cryptid. One. Suddenly, we've already shifted into <laughs> Secrets of Doctor Who. We've... <laughs> <laughs> now back to Secrets of Star Wars, Star Wars. already in progress. Already in progress. <laughs> yeah, and, and the Jedi, you know, share those kind of, that kind of military, but also quasi-monastic, you know, attributes with the historical Templar order. Yes. You know, because, you know, 
not only were the Templar knights, did they did they take vows? You know, a lot of times the knights didn't take permanent vows, but they also had a, a permanent part of the Templar order who were non-military, who, who lived a monastic life in Europe supporting the knights on the front lines during the crusades mm. so yeah i definitely think given that naming convention which was dropped in later scripts i definitely think he had you know at least some forms of christian monasticism on the brain when you know he and it, it it's hard too not to see kind of the desert fathers in obi-wan kenobi just because oh, of the much. environment that he's in <laughs> yeah that's I, I think that's a really good analogy um because it also has it it brings with it the same problems that the Templars had, which is sort of the, how do you balance this concept of, um, you know, sort of the monastic being at peace with, you know, the God's work and what you have and sort of the drive to go, it, you know, go to war basically effectively. And, and how do you balance it? And I, I have seen a lot of problems with the Jedi <laughs> oh, <laughs> balancing yeah. that, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Indeed. Well, the Templars and and to some extent, European knights in general, and and I mean, he did keep the the name Jedi Knights, right? So yeah, that, that so remains. there's there's yeah. that chivalric uh, uh, resonance there, but um, especially the the Templars and and the Knights of the Crusades were going on what they perceived as a holy war. Mm -hmm. and for you know to serve god's purposes and let's just set aside like the historical crusades and all the messiness you know the the good intentions mixed with bad intentions mixed with good practices and bad practices we'll just set all that aside like any war um, really yeah. yeah like any war yeah. but but the idea of it the ideal of it uh being a, a war to accomplish a divine purpose, um, a war to accomplish a holy purpose, and therefore, as a warrior, to take on um, a, a sort of religious practice in the in the performance of your life as a soldier, um, right? You know. Incorporate those monastic disciplines. Although, interestingly enough, I remember it was actually, on, I think, on Jimmy's episode on the Templars. He mentions that the knights were exempt from praying the whole the whole Psalter, which a lot of monks okay. had to do a lot of times because some of the 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 knights just they, they couldn't learn it. They couldn't memorize it. So they were instead of 150 Psalms, they would recite 150 Potter Nosters or mm -hmm. Our Fathers. So they they were incorporating this daily prayer routine into their lives and and having ascetical practices. I remember reading there's there's an excellent book just called The Templars that's by uh gosh, I believe the the historian's name is Dan Jones. And he writes a really balanced look at the Templars and he describes some of their di disciplinary in the sense of ways to correct infractions some of their disciplinary practices and and okay. they were very common kind of monastic penances <clears throat> you know you're excommunicated from the common table for a while or you have to wear sackcloth or sleep on the floor or things like that different disciplines to um mold the will in someone who's, you know, straying and starting to commit infractions against the rule. And by the way, their rule was, um, the rule of the Templars was constructed by the famous Bernard of Clairvaux. Oh, okay. Who's a yeah. famous, yeah, medieval, I believe he's associated with the, um, uh, with one of the reforms of the, the Benedictines. The Cistercians, the I Cistercians. believe. The Cistercians, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that's something that we don't often see uh portrayed is sort of what you do with a jedi who's gone astray or who is mm. straight off right oftentimes what we see is a jedi if there's a jedi who's gone astray they're already so far astray that when whatever jedi has been sent to sort of bring them back into the fold there's a conflict right there's an immediate physical confrontation that results mm -hmm. in one or one yeah. or both of them being dead <laughs> um <laughs> i mean we don't i mean or, that's or escaping. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, it does. But it's interesting. There's no there's no set of like penitential practices or, well, you did this bad thing. So now you need to make up for it or mm -hmm. um, it, there isn't like a really strict. It doesn't seem to be that there is a really strict moral code. Like. I think it, it was interesting to me in episode two when um, with the bounty hunter that they take down and end up killing and there's no like sort of follow on from there, right? There's no, okay. Obi-Wan has to go in front of a, you know, a, an internal audit. <laughs> yeah, did you really yeah, have to no kill this person? After action inquiry or, or anything. Right. Right. Like, and maybe there was, and it just wasn't on screen, you know, cause paperwork is boring. But <laughs> on the other hand, I don't, it didn't feel like there ever was. And mm. it never felt like the Jedi were, that not only were they not often accountable to anybody else, they weren't even mm -hmm. accountable to themselves. Oh, um, the, the, these are the guys where, where a member of the council, Sifo DS, goes missing and nobody follows up on it. Yeah. Nobody cares. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sifo DS. I remember <laughs> him. him. Go he missing. Was one of us, he wasn't did. He? You know, yeah, like, yeah. Was... Same with Yaddle. Well, they don't investigate that. Yeah. And so, yeah, they are not very disciplined in terms of their <laughs> their their leadership and internal. And yeah, I've I've always seen that, you know, especially with the prequels, that it kind of exposes the late era Jedi as like they're a mess. Well, and, and even when we do get a sense of the the legal process or the disciplinary process, mm -hmm. um, like uh, maybe the best example is uh, Ahsoka's trial mm. um when ah ahsoka is accused of sabotage and, and treason um for for the explosions in the the jedi temple um you the the punishment is like you know either she's completely acquitted or you know she's she's gone i think i think they even want to put her to death um it's been a while since I've watched those episodes, mm. but um And that was a civil trial, was it not? Like I think Palpatine himself was in the judge's chair. I believe so, yeah. I think they um gosh, now I want to go back and watch, and watch these episodes. <laughs> Do a um, whole episode on that arc. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I think that's a good um kind of exposure of how tied in the Jedi were with the new Republic by that point, or not mm. the new, but the, the Republic. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, like we're going to draw back to the Templars a little bit. You have, you know, the Templars were going off to what they consider to be a Holy war. Um, but that had a religious significance. Right. And the Jedi, when they get called from being, you know, effectively police action folks to generals, in mm -hmm. you know a galaxy spanning war there's no i mean i don't know about if there was any sort of will of the force involved there but there doesn't seem to be any sort of like religious reason like i, I often ask myself i'm like why are the jedi doing this like i i get mm -hmm. from uh like it's cool on screen <laughs> part of it I but mean, from a there's your answer <laughs> okay well yeah done <laughs> i think part of it too is that they they see themselves as defenders of the republic but they've been that in a for for generations in peacetime conditions and they don't know how to function anymore in wartime conditions and they just assume it means we just go along with the policy of the central government. And they're so tied into that, whereas the Templars were actually a supra-national organization. They were not tied specifically to any one European government at the time of the Crusade. So they had levels of autonomy. I mean, that's part of what got them in the end, was that, yeah. you know, leaders of governments like the King of France, you know, feared their, you know, international autonomy. You know, and oh gosh, there's like so many like cool, like historical parallels with the Jedi but, and and different, you know, Christian and non-Christian organizations throughout history.
But I think one thing, too, that I just want to mention before I forget it is that the word discipline, you know, we're talking about discipline in a, mm-hmm. in a Christian context that has connotations of disciple. So right. in, in a, and that really ties into the Jedi because in, in a Christian context, we think of discipline in terms of a master teacher relationship, discipleship, where the master is Jesus Christ and we are the apprentices, essentially, you know, the disciples, yeah. the ones who, who are subjected to discipline. And in the Jedi, we see a lot of that in the master Padawan relationship. And there's mm-hmm. so many great examples throughout the whole, you know, Star Wars canon and, and even elsewhere in the, in the non-canon material. But yeah, that you see that theme of master disciple played out over the whole saga. And that, I mean, we've been talking about discipline in the sense of, of uh, like enforcement and punishment, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, I think it is that, um, uh, Another another sort of word play that that uh, struck me when I was in in university was um, that study and zeal share a common root. Oh, and and so the the idea is that, you know, to learn something requires a, a level of dedication and uh, engagement and focus. It, it requires your whole person uh, to be dedicated to, to the task of learning. Um, and that means giving up things that are not related to that task of learning, giving Mm. up the things that, that other, um, that other ways of life would, would, uh, provide. Um, and we so, see that from the very beginning with Jedi, they have to give up yeah. family ties, you know? Well, yeah, this is, this, and this is the, the kind of the big one that, um, that, that, you know, the, the whole Skywalker saga is kind of built around is Anakin's, uh, needing to give up family ties and, and how he doesn't like that and doesn't, how he deals badly with it. Mm-hmm. Go, go, uh, Thomas, I think you were going to say more and I interrupted you. No, no, I, I was just kind of, I was, I was thinking about what you said in terms of like, yeah, it's, I've always thought it interesting that the Jedi see this need to begin the formation of the Padawan from essentially infancy, you yeah. know, <laughs> whereas like, and I, I'm actually reading uh, some of the, the writings of a very interesting saint um right now for research purposes um hildegard of bingen was a medieval Mm. abbess Mm -hmm. and she actually took the veil at eight years old which was wow which was permitted under um under the rule of saint benedict but it had to be the individual's choice the child actually had to choose this it couldn't be forced on them because like the rule of saint benedict basically says look St. Benedict's like, look, I know the rich are going to try and push their extra children on us. <laughs> who they can't <laughs> give lands and money to in inheritance. So they're yeah. going to try and, and pressure their younger children into monastic life. Don't let them do that. The kid has mm-hmm. to make the decision. And apparently Hildegard freely chose. She was the 10th the, the child and her, her parents wanted to dedicate her to God as kind of a tithe you know, one tenth of the, the children of their surviving children. As and, you do. But yeah. Yeah, as, 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 as landed do. gentry did back then, I guess. But I mean, it, was, it was usually the third child. So your, your, your first one you set up, he was going to inherit your land. And the mm-hmm. second one you set up as a knight. And then the third one third you put one. into the church. The church. So that, At least sons anyway. Yeah. Right. Sons. In, in yeah. hope that he would become a bishop or an abbot or a cardinal. Somebody who could help you out, politi- help the family <laughs> out politically. <laughs> yeah. But right. in this case, apparently she chose, her biographers are quite clear that she chose at eight years old to take the veil. So it's like, and that's not far from Anakin's age when he joins the Jedi. And yeah. yet they see it as a problem. He's too old. And I just, 
yeah, I, it's just always been a sticking point with me. I'm like, no, he's not. If anything, he's too young and they're calling him too old. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I have always had a problem with that conceptually because especially since, I mean, the way Jedi tend to or seem to operate, like going out into the universe and acting as protectors and righting wrongs and doing that stuff. It means you deal with real people right Mm -hmm. and you spend the entirety of your youth in a secluded temple with other force users how are you gonna relate to real people (laughs) yeah oh yeah not everybody can throw rocks with their mind i keep forgetting that like (laughs) like i mean how how do you relate to uh, other people when you are and in effect something like you know the u.s marshals or the or the texas rangers if, if they were really... also cloistered religious. <laughs> right. Like, like yeah. that, that's always been very confusing to me. I'm like, why would you set it up this way? Like, I, I mean, I get the need for intensive training, but there, mm-hmm. there also seems to be a need for, I don't know, broad based compassion for your fellow creatures. I guess that's the way well, to put again, it. Well, <laughs> again, I, I think. I think we're kind of getting back to the rule of cool here and, mm-hmm. and Lucas's idea of there are all of these different traditions that he wants to draw on and 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 embody in the Jedi. And um like I'm I'm thinking of um uh it may be Ignatius of Loyola himself, but the sort of Jesuit idea of, you know, you give me someone as a child and I will I will build the adult. You know um, that that sort of deeply educational model, and um, all of these sort of mythological traditions, and and we have them among uh, there. There are quite a few Catholic saints who, like Hildegard, as very young children, declared their uh, intention and loyalty to God and God alone mm. or. In other religious traditions, you see, you know, um, like I'm thinking of of uh, uh, Rama in in the um, in the Hindu tradition of, of oh, yeah. like doing miracles as a child, mm. um, and you know all of, all of these different, um, you know. So I think I think Ooh, or uh, Hannah devoting Simeon to the temple, uh, not Simeon. Uh-huh. Um, uh, um, Samuel, uh, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel yeah. is devoted to the temple as a child, as like an infant, yeah. and like he grows up with um, uh, Eli. God, Eli, with thank Eli, you. Yeah, we just had this reading a few <laughs> weeks ago, and already yeah. I've forgotten their names. <laughs> Eli and Eli's terrible, terrible sons. <laughs> we may be bad Star Wars fans, but we're even worse Catholics. Yes, <laughs> I mean it's also after 10 p.m. where I am. So I'm not thinking straight anyway. Yeah. No fair being accurate, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But yes, yeah, there, there is this tradition throughout the world of, you know, either uh, both in mythology and in history of either de- devoting a child to God. I mean, to, to, as we're recording this, it's the Feast of the Presentation. Right, right. Where the Holy Family, Mary and Joseph, they bring Jesus to the temple because the the son who opens the womb is to be dedicated to the Lord. Yeah. And that, that, um, that struck me, actually, when I was reading it this morning. I'm like, what does that mean? When, like, I don't honestly, like, I wish I knew more about what that would have meant to Mary and Joseph, that you're dedicating your firstborn son to the Lord does that mean that they would have had an expectation of him functioning in a religious capacity? I know they weren't of the tribe of Levi, so they weren't of the priestly caste. But I just wonder what that would have meant to a first century Jewish family of dedicating your firstborn son to the Lord. I don't know if either of you know anything about that, but. Well, I, yeah, I think it entirely depends on who Mary and Joseph were. Mm. Um because depending on the literature from that time frame, um, you know, like the Proto-Evangelium of James and some of the mm. other stuff, it, it gives you a feel like Mary herself had been dedicated to the temple at one point. 
right um had been set off um and so there may have been this sort of just expectation that this was just part of having been connected to the temple and having you know cousins elizabeth and and um oh shoot i'm bad with names zachariah <laughs> yeah zachariah oh this were would, of the priestly cast yeah right yes this yeah. would be the thing that you would go do um but it would and and both but both of them knew right we have at this point that mary has at least spoken with the angel gabriel at least one time and mm-hmm. that joseph has had it in a dream at least once and he's going to get another fun dream just in a little bit here that's going to shoot him over to egypt so <laughs> um, and then of course they encounter simeon who has the prophetic utterance mm-hmm. you know and and who who tells mary that like like what the, what your son is going to go through, you'll also suffer for it. You know, he says, a soul, a sword will pierce your soul. And so we have that whole thing, too. It's like, you know, as, as Christians, we also see discipline as, in some mystical way, participating in the passion of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because, you know, as St. Paul says, like, in his astonishing teaching that our our earthly suffering somehow he says make up for what is lacking in the sufferings of christ which is just an astounding teaching you know i'm not sure we'll oh, yeah we'll ever know the fullness of what that means until the other side but and that kind of brings us back to the jedi too because i don't think they know quite how to handle things like that <laughs> as anakin's sort of confessional scene in Revenge of the Sith with Yoda, like, clearly articulates, Yoda is trying to sort of give him the sort of stoic answer. Mm -hmm. Kind Mm -hmm. of the answer that Seneca the Younger would give to you. Or Marcus Aurelius. You know, like, (laughs) everybody dies. You just have to deal with it. People pass on, you know, just stiff upper lip and, you know, that's it. And... He's not offering him the kind of compassion, the kind of compassionate pastoral care that Anakin really needs at this moment when he's clearly in mental anguish. Yoda mm-hmm. doesn't seem to be able to help him. Yeah, Yoda, uh, I, I thought, I caught it as a very um, Taoist approach to things, mm. and um, which is great when you're... 900 years old or 800 years old but when you're a 20 something who's full of passion uh Taoism mm-hmm. often does not hit <laughs> it, it it passes the mark and that's kind of what you, yeah cuz cuz Anakin is in pretty dire mental anguish mm-hmm. and trying to figure out what to do to stop this terrible thing that's coming well and i i wonder if it's because you know, we've talked about discipline as as like a punishment or, or discipline as, um, you know, in terms of the presentation, discipline is a sacrifice. Mm. Um, but the the Jedi don't seem to have either of those aspects of discipline in their in their philosophy. They only have this idea of discipline as teaching and right. so, or asceticism. Or, well, yeah, but maybe the asceticism is for is for what purpose? It's exactly that's what I mean. Yeah, like you know, it, 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 it seems to be because and and honestly, it's it's interesting to me um, how the um, one of the the common aspects of. Uh, monastic life around the world in, in not just in Christianity, but in, in other traditions as well is the idea of celibacy. Mm-hmm. Um, if only a kind of temporary celibacy. Um, and so that's, that's clearly, you know, where, where Lucas is drawing from, but the, in the East, it seems that that is, not not so much a discipline to um well it or or rather it is a discipline to train the mind to detach from the desires of the body 
the desires of the flesh, as we would say. And for us Christians, we, we kind of attach more to it than just a teaching discipline. We, we attach a, a, you know, a spiritual significance that we are, we are being united to our Lord. Um, sometimes, uh, through the mediation of our lady, um, and, and that the, the sacrifice of our, uh, sexuality or, you know, is, is a is a sacrifice is an offering to god right because you 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 sacrifice what's good just like you know i mean did, did this goes that vision of sacrifice goes all the way back to cain and abel abel sacrifices what's good his first fruits cain gets in trouble because he sacrifices you know the leftovers basically you know stuff that is that he doesn't really care about true sacrifice you're sacrificing something that is meaningful to you that is a concrete good and in celibacy and especially in the christian tradition you're sacrificing something that would be good marriage and a, and a family are good mm -hmm. and yet you are sacrificing them for the for a greater good which is that total spiritual dedication and conformity to the the life of christ yeah, but 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 in the in the instance where Yoda is badly counseling Anakin, <laughs> like he doesn't he doesn't have any of that. Yeah. To give all he has is, you know, well, detachment. Mm -hmm. Detachment is good. Um and in and of itself need, seemingly. Yeah, yeah, right. we need to learn to detach, which is a very Taoist or Buddhist, uh, you know, a very Eastern sort of approach to, to that discipline. And, um, I think, I think a lot of it draws from the notion of the uh, suffering being the greatest evil, right? So if, yes. su if suffering is your highest evil, then the detachment path, uh, then that is like the way a way forward and if i can detach from the world and the things of the world then i can get away from suffering because my detachments are what or my attachments are what caused me suffering mm. um you know in christianity we have something very similar but not quite the same because it's not so much attachments to things of the world it's over attachment it's <clears throat> i love this good more than the good Right, I love this good more than God, um, or right. I am attached to this good more than more than I'm, and so it's in in the Christian tradition. It's okay to do the good things unless they become more important to you than God. Right? If I can't drop them for God, then they've become too much. Whereas in you know Buddhism, it's sort of like no, no. Eventually, you've got to get to the point where you you drop it because you drop it. There's because yeah. it'll cause you suffering if you don't. Um, and so I think, you know, and I, I think it's interesting bringing up celibacy because it's not like for the, for the priests um, in the Catholic priests, it's a discipline, right? It's not a, a dogma. It's not a, you know, thou shalt be celibate if you are a priest, because there are the, the Eastern traditions that don't follow that. The bishops mm -hmm. are, but the, the priests are not. Uh, but it is a discipline because it is seen as a, a higher good. You know, we have what Paul gave us, which basically lays it out that, you know, if, <clears throat> if you can do it, and if you can't, you know, go get married. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but that it's a good. And, and Paul kind of says, this is my opinion. Like this is not, um, you know, and, but I, I like that it is a discipline of the church but it has its underpinnings in disciplehood of Christ, right? It's, it's a discipline that doesn't just exist because, well, we think it'll, it'll be a good thing. Um, like it, it, it is a good thing and it does bear fruit and it is good, but it, it is also part of, uh, like kind of, uh, I call it extreme, but part of a, a very visceral connection to, to the discipline of Christ because he wasn't married. He didn't, he didn't do that good. Instead, he took on the higher good of the discipleship of his father, basically being mm. disciplined to his father's will. 
I don't know if I managed to pull every meaning of the word discipline into that, but I was trying really hard. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you didn't, we'll review the audio, and if you didn't, we'll discipline you for it. <laughs> um, no, but this, uh, yeah, this. Uh, so so uh, kind of sticking with the um the the celibacy example i'm i'm thinking of uh in episode two the conversation that anakin and pod may have when they're on the transport um i think they're on the transport or maybe yeah. they're in a cafe or something no yeah they're um, on the well they're in the mess hall on the transport okay okay um and they're talking about that and and he he talks about how um it's avoiding attachment in order that he can sort of treat everyone with compassion with love which he rightly says is a higher form of love right um and that's um you know this is this is something that uh you know again not to not to poo poo the buddhists because they also draw this conclusion that that compassion for others is a result of detachment from the lesser goods or or the things of this world um and yet as as you were saying patrick it's it's this uh notion that we don't simply detach we detach from the things of the flesh, the things of this world, in order to attach to Christ, to to enter into communion with Christ, and through Him with the whole communion of saints. And and um, I remember when I was um, in high school, and I was heartbroken because um, the girl that I liked um, had told me she wanted to be just friends, and. Um, and I was at mass and, um, and I realized that in receiving communion, that I was actually closer to her than any earthly love could bring me in receiving the body and blood of Christ, because that is where ultimately we do have our, our, our real union with each other and it was kind of a cold comfort at the time um, <laughs> because you know teenager um but there's there's a i think there's a deep truth that you know the love that i have in this life whatever love i have in my own heart is nothing compared to the love of god and the union that I seek in this life is nothing compared to the communion that God has uh, prepared for us in in Christ, who is the union between God and humanity, God and you know Creator and creation. And I think that's the thing that um, that really gives power and strength to our notion of of disciplines like for lent um that you know what what we're after is a a union with the you know all of our disciplines in lent are tied to the life of christ right right um, yeah you know the prayer the fasting the almsgiving um, these are tied to primarily to, you know, his 40 days in the desert, but also to, um, you know, the, the various sufferings, his, his passion and death of Holy week and so on. And I think it's, um, I don't think I would have ever recognized that if I hadn't been a star Wars fan. Hmm. Like, I don't think I would have seen, like, I don't think I would have been open to the idea of, of penance and discipline and such being good things if I hadn't been, you know, deeply committed to becoming a Jedi, if only it were possible. <laughs> um, 
and and yet it's it's clear to me that you know what what the catholic church is is talking about when it talks about discipline and penance is is something much bigger than than what the jedi are talking about and and it's like if if i ever wrote fan fiction i think i would write about like the i think i would just delve into the spirituality of the jedi and try to like flesh out the jedi and and make them as as full and as rich a tradition spiritually as um as i wanted them to be um and and as i think i've found in in my catholic faith right cuz they are a bit spiritually incoherent and i often wonder too whether that is a is part of the reason they fall later is that like like kind of what you were getting at earlier pat they don't really understand themselves why they're fighting this war towards the end like what what is the reasons behind it you know like what is the will of the force in this matter what does this have to do with their mission their vocation as jedi knights right because that's the thing if you have a vocation discipline is so important you know no matter what that vocation is whether it's to you know your your spouse in married life or you know, you have a vocation to the consecrated life or the priesthood or the committed single life in some way. You have disciplines. You need to have structure. You need to your your beliefs and actions need to be oriented towards this greater good, this greater purpose. And I feel like the Jedi lose their way. I think they even say that several times. We're losing our way. You know, like mm-hmm. you know, they mm-hmm. are losing that connection to their vocation, which you know at least from the from what we're told about them in the original trilogy seems to be that they were there to help the defenseless you know the ordinary person in the mm. galaxy to be there for the people to defend people from injustice and whereas now they they seem to have morphed over the course of the clone wars into the enforcers of an unjust situation you know of a of a war whose whose justice is clearly questionable, <laughs> given that it was all contrived in the first place. Yeah, you know, that's, like that's one of my favorite lines from Andor, and when it turned out who we were fighting ourselves. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. <it's> just <laughs> what was that war yeah. even about? But I, and I think I love the exploration they do in Tales of the Jedi with Dooku. Oh um, yeah, so good. Where he 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 sort of comes to that realization that like we're we're kind of just being lackeys for the Republic. Mm-hmm. And you know, while I don't agree with his decision to join up with Sidious and become a Sith, I I kind of get it because it, the Jedi strike me very much as sort of the the guru soup that you have and kind of the New Age ish religion ishness <laughs> i don't even know how like because it's not i can't just say like the new age religions or or wicca or something like that because it's all very spread out and it's entirely dependent on the individual leader or guru or teacher or whatever mm-hmm. and the jedi strike me very much as being like that like there are certain masters who have certain philosophies and they teach it to their apprentices and that's sort of different schools that mm-hmm. have abilities mm-hmm. Whereas in the Sith, it's like, no, this is how we do it. <laughs> like, this is it. <laughs> this At is least being... in the Baynite Sith, because yeah. they want out over all the others. So, right. Yeah. Their way um, or the highway. <laughs> right. And, yeah. And, I mean, th- that's that's a discipline of uh, that's a pretty intense discipline. The rule of two. Mm, right. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why, by the way, why was and why was anybody most of all Snoke? surprised at what kylo ren does to him (laughs) i'm like whether or not you're calling yourself sith come on man walks like one dresses like one quacks like one because they spout sith ideology so the 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 apprentice will always destroy the master to take his place and seize because it's all about will to power yeah, I mean, which requires yeah. discipline, <laughs> that will <laughs> to the putting of absolute power above everything. You know, it's obvious 
that the apprentice will destroy the master. And when, when Snoke is like, Kylo Ren will strike down his greatest enemy. I'm like, well, for any Sith apprentice, who's their greatest enemy? The master. Yeah. It's yeah. the master who needs to be destroyed <laughs> so that you could take which, his place. Which is why it kind of surprised me when the Praetorian guard then turned and attacked them. Yeah. Right. That was That's true. I mean, it's, well. it's, it's a it's a an amazing fight scene mm, yes. and and one of the highlights of that movie. But um, no, not one of. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> you you know my opinion about that lightsaber fight. We've had this discussion. <laughs> But yeah, you'd think the Praetorians would be would be indoctrinated into how this works. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, you know, I guess the, he's the in king is now. dead. Long live the king. <laughs> right, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, Sith is dead. Long live the Sith. Yeah, it's and how they, they they clearly discipline themselves in the sense that they sacrifice everything for the achievement of temporal power. Of absolute yeah. temporal power. And everything is sacrificed to that end. And I've, I, I regret to say that I haven't read it yet. But I've heard that, that essentially that is the plot of the, the Plagueis novel. Oh, and if, okay. if either of you have read it, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that Palpatine sacrifices everything. Family, everything, for his ambitions. For power. You know, and that that nothing is beyond sacrifice for him. Nothing is beyond sacrificing for that ultimate goal of, you know, power and immortality. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's that I, I feel like that. What, what do you think? That, do, do they want the power for immortality or the immortality for power? I, I think it's one of those one of those yeah. snakes that eats its own tail. Right. Mm. Or yeah. two snakes yeah, the, that are eating each other's tail. Either way, like it's, the it's worm or yes. yeah. yeah, it's a Mobius strip, yeah. however you put it. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and I think I think that reason, you know, the Sith are just so ridiculously focused and disciplined because of that, and then the Jedi as an organization are so not <laughs> so you know guru oriented that. Uh, it leaves the opening that Sidious can use with a war to sort of draw them completely away from any sort of real connection to the will of the force or any sort of discipline about what they're doing and can kind of cast them under the Republic instead of being beside it, which is where I think they were supposed to be. So the, you know, the, the, di the discipline is hugely important but it it can be good or bad depending on what the the end goal mm, yeah you know, what is you are disciplining yourself for and we see that in the real world otherwise you know the psalmist would not say oh lord why do the wicked prosper yeah you know and some of the wicked prosper because they are highly disciplined people and motivated to get exactly what they want at the expense of anybody and anything. Yeah. And, and again, I'm like, this is just so resonating with like, you know, nine year old me. Um, <laughs> who's who's yeah. like, I, I don't want it. I am in full on rebellion against my parents and I'm full on rebellion against my teachers, but I will, I will do anything to, you know, if I could be a Jedi. Um, you know, I, I would endure, you know, I, I would endure any training. I would endure any de deprivation. Um, if, if I could, you know, be that kind of, um, I, in, in my mind, noble hero. And of course this is before the, the prequel trilogy came out. And so this is before like the, the whole story explored the the difficulties and corruption of the Jedi as an order. Um, but I think it's the same again in real life. It's like, what is it? What is it that is the ideal that's worth sacrificing for? That's worth. Um, yeah. I, I, OK, so it comes back to um, the Gospel of John, you know, 
There's no greater love than this, than someone lays down their life for their friends. You know, what is it? What is it that we love so much that we are willing to, to give up everything for? Give up um, pleasure, give up uh, comfort, give up, you know, every, everything that seems good for, for that which truly is good. Well, that strikes to the heart of the whole series, because in the end, Anakin Skywalker sacrifices his own life for the sake of his sons. Yeah. That in that moment, he realizes that that's the most important thing. Not any of this other stuff, you know, not the power, not the, the, the guilt that he carries for what, you know, happened with Padme and all that. that none of that matters in, in that moment. He makes the right choice. You know, and that that that's just Star Wars, you know, <laughs> that yeah. there's well, yeah. and, and, you know, this is Kylo and Ray or Ben and Ray at the end of of Rise of Skywalker, you know, literally willing to sacrifice themselves for the other. They're very and, life force. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, you know, you have what I love about it, especially after the prequels is you know, Vader standing there watching his son being uh, light force lightning, you mm -hmm. know, it, this consideration of what did all of this, what did all of this power and control buy me in the end? Yes. Right. I am, I am barely a, a person, right. I'm being kept alive by these machines. I have what must be very apparent at that point to be a really insane master. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, you know, I killed my wife, I, and, I, and I don't have control, right? I don't have the power, and I've given all this up, and now I'm going to watch my son die. Yeah, none of that still stuff not... Sidious promised. It was right. all and a I've, lie. Yeah, it's all a lie. It's all got it. And, and let's face it, if, even if I strike my master down now, I won't have what I wanted in the first place, which was, you know, a family, <laughs> which was a wife and children. That's right. Yeah, because yeah, that's yeah. what he wanted. And yeah. and because of the discipline of the Jedi, which said I could he couldn't do that. <laughs> he, he takes him all the way down that line to Vader throwing Palpatine over the only railing that exists in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> and he's also remembering the last time he had to make this choice between Palpatine and doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the throne room in Revenge of the Sith. Yep. And he's like, Yeah. The last time you totally played me like a fiddle. And I'm not I'm not doing it anymore. You know? <laughs> and what you said, Robert, before about that ideal of the Jedi is something I really hope that they explore going forward. Whether it, mm. especially because in future movies are going to talk about rebuilding the Jedi Order again <laughs> after it's mm -hmm. been destroyed twice now. Yeah. That <laughs> I hope we see the Jedi, and they can do this either in the future of Star Wars or even going back into the past, even farther back than the, the High Republic, is we need to see them as they were meant to be. You know? That, that ideal that, that people would be willing to sacrifice for, to give up a family or to give up, you know, worldly goods or whatever, to, to belong to this community. Because that's the other thing. Jedi don't do discipline alone, like any monastic group, that they're in community, you mm -hmm. know, and to sacrifice the community of, say, family for this community of people who all have the same vocation and that vocation is to help the helpless. And man, I really hope we see that realized at some point, you know, I, yeah, I, I get what they're doing in the prequels to see them as, as a, as a fallen organization made up of fallen people. But man, I would like to see them, you know, doing what they are meant to be doing. Oh, yeah, I 100% I agree. And I mean, this is, again, it's, it's like, I understand why they wanted to explore the dark side of the Jedi 
to put it in that sense to the the corruption the hypocrisy the the weakness um the lack of ideals yeah it explains um, how you get a guy like vader it explains how you get a guy like vader it also makes it really relatable i mean there there is no ideal in real life that that stands up to scrutiny mm-hmm. um you know we just uh, you know we we all of us fall short of what we strive toward but if we don't have an ideal somewhere and this is this is what star wars was for me as a child and and what i hope it can be again for for more generations is is like something of an ideal to strive toward. Um, yeah. Because, because if you don't have that ideal, then you either turn to a false ideal, like, you know, absolute power, <laughs> um, or you give up altogether. And it's like, well, what, what discipline is worth anything? You know, why, yeah. why should I bother? doing anything that's difficult and that brings um, us back to, I... to knighthood like we were talking at the beginning because you have in you know the because i've been reading a lot of the the arthur mythos lately and you have okay you have fallen knights like lancelot whose betrayal yeah. and hypocrisy destroys the round table and everything it stands for but then you also have percival and galahad those the the ideal of the perfect knight and you you can have both you know and in i i think i i would like to see the the jedi version of percival Percival. or galahad you know that you know that kind of knight exemplar i think i think knighthood is a very good real world analog to being a force user um or or being a Jedi, like because <clears throat> knights in that time frame were typically rich folk, right? And so, yeah. like any yeah. rich folk in any era, you can use your rich powers for good, <laughs> or you can use your rich powers for evil. <laughs> or you can be Batman or Lex Luthor. <laughs> That's right. You yeah. can do, and sometimes you're both. But. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that that was always an option on the table, and yeah. going and becoming, especially a consecrated knight um, or one that took vows and orders, you were very purposefully saying, "I am going to use my means and resources for those who have lesser means and resources than I do." And to me, the Jedi, what the Jedi ideal strikes me as, is one of the ways that you deal with the fact that you have superpowers, right? Like, I seem to be able to control the weather or, you know, throw rocks with my mind or or confuse people or, you know, I seem to be able to do this Mm -hmm. stuff and nobody else can. So I can either golem this and use it against (laughs) my friends and family, (laughs) you know, which kind of leads down the Sith Sith road. Um, Mm -hmm. Or I can decide I've been gifted this by whatever however you want to put it i have this and so i'm going to use it for the good of you know whoever i can and that strikes me as like the ideal that the order was likely founded on like i can't guarantee i can't point to any reference in any of the materials that says that's it but it seems like the the concept of being compassionate to all people of helping those in need of, you know, doing hard things that people can't do has to stem from that, from this, I've been given a gift and I need to use it to help others. Like, you know, it always goes back to Spider-Man, right? (laughs) With with (laughs) great power comes great responsibility. And I would absolutely love to see the Jedi order in that, that light instead of the one we we've, you know, in the prequels, which is very much a, no, our job is to, to help the new Republic or not. I keep saying new Republic to help the Republic, um, enforce the status quo. Yeah. Right. And I, you know, I think it, it would be easy to fall into that way of doing things. If the Republic was of the same mind, 
if they were like, well, we've established this galactic order to make, you know, trade and, and make uh, travel and, and unite people and make things better for everybody, share technology, make it all good for everybody, right? If that, if that was their original setup, which I assume it was, then it would be very easy to tie the Jedi Order mindset into that. But then, you know, politics. <laughs> yeah <laughs> happens and so the jedi i feel like they just sort of slowly got dragged along with them yeah yeah so so it sounds like our hope is that we see maybe uh, um a story of of jedi going from struggle and temptation and corruption to nobility and ideal which is which is what we got in Luke. Oh, which yeah. is actually what we get in, in Han. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I think there's still potential for that with Ray. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. The the potential is there. I I yeah. I hope they don't waste it. <laughs> yeah. As long as she actually yeah. struggles with something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Something with consequences. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, writers on Star Wars, please hear us. <laughs> give Ray some good consequences to struggle with. Um, I mean, and, and if... give her give her an ideal to strive toward and 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 to to uh, inspire her to overcome. If if I didn't yeah. think there were potential in in what they were doing with the sequels, I would not have wasted so many hours of my life trying to figure out how they could have done it better. <laughs> if I didn't believe that the potential was there, I wouldn't care so much. Yeah, I would have spent yeah. so much time angry. <laughs> uh well, on that note, um <laughs> Yeah, before we get so we, undisciplined that we start ranting about the sequel. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we will we will invoke the discipline of of the podcast um to to bring it to a close. It it has been a really fascinating discussion. Thank you. Um to you who are listening, uh we would love to hear your thoughts on discipline in the force in real life on how they relate. Um you can drop us a line at Star Wars at sqpn.com. Uh, you can reach us on Facebook at StarQuest Media. Uh, we have a really active Discord server, which I love. Um, you can get access to that server through uh, our website, sqpn.com slash Discord. Um, we also want to thank those who make it possible for us to make these podcasts. Uh, we want to thank especially the patrons on Patreon uh, who support us. Uh, in this episode, Jeff B, Lisa B, Gray R, Mario S, and Cameron C. Thank you for your generous support. If any of you out there would like to join them in keeping our work going, please visit sqpn.com slash give um it helps us when you subscribe to uh this podcast on whatever platform you listen to uh, we are on apple uh tune in spotify iheart radio lots of others i particularly enjoy our youtube channel i think it's delightful to have an audio medium on a video platform <laughs> um so check out sqpn on uh, youtube and for tonight, that is, uh, I think that wraps it up. Um, Patrick, thank you for being on the show tonight. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on. Thomas, it's always great to have you. Thank you, Robert. And may the force be with you. <laughs> and may the force be with you both. Thank you both for joining me in sharing the secrets of Star Wars. Again, I'm Robert King. Thank you all for listening to the secrets of Star Wars on StarQuest. another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy, PlayStation Portable. Find it wherever fine podcasts are found or at starquest.fm slash PSP.